Hey, I want to welcome everybody to what I believe is our fourth third Thursday. So do the math on all that. Really glad to have you all here. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm the education director for the MRA, for those of you that may not know me, and I'm thrilled to uh, have a, a group of people uh, that I'm going to introduce very briefly in the introduction for the night. And then also uh, then we'll do a quick introduction of our uh, special speaker uh, for the night. But before we do that, thank you to everybody who's been involved in this program. Michael St. John, who will take the mic in just a moment. He's the guy who came up with this concept. We really appreciate the great graphic arts work from Ella Foskett, Gary Ferris, the MRA webmaster, Don Wilson, who brings us our sponsors. Tonight, we're going to hear from RECO, and Ava Sophia Shemansky, who is our Zoom host and who uh, supports us throughout these programs, including in the Q&A. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Michael St. John, Marin County Sheriff Search and Rescue in uh, the Bay Area, to tell us a little bit about the April 3rd Thursday. The March 3rd Thursday coming up is uh, on the topic of drones, but we're really excited about the uh, concept for the April 3rd Thursday. And, and Michael, if you're on, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Charlie, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a new concept coming out, which is mission reviews or mission debrief. And uh, we have two debriefs set up for uh, April. Uh, first off is gonna be Salt Lake County uh, Sheriff's Mountain Rescue. And they're gonna have a presentation on the Mill Creek Avalanche, uh, which is an incident just from a week and a half ago uh, that unfortunately uh, uh, had four, four fatalities and uh, others injured. Uh, two-day operation. And then next up, we'll have Inyo County Sheriff's Search and Mountain Rescue. And they're going to talk about an extended search for a missing hiker in the Whitney Portal area um, and talk about uh, Google mapping or Apple mapping issues, as well as the importance of situational awareness. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, thank you, Charlie. Michael, thanks for coming up with this concept. We've had uh, upwards of 200 and more participants at each one of these and uh, really appreciate your help. I will let everybody know that starting probably next month, we're going to transition to a password um, system that you'll get a password for these trainings through the MRA website. Um, and in particular, when we talk about missions coming up, that'll be uh, really important. I now want to introduce, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing the screen so Chris can can uh, go on camera. Chris Roosh from uh, um, the East Coast uh, with the host of our um, uh, the host of our spring conference in June, which we're still confident we'll be able to hold hold. And Chris has been very involved with the MRA with Appalachian Mountain Rescue, and he's going to tell us a, a, a little bit about uh, the upcoming conference. And so, Chris, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you go on camera. Great, thank you, Charlie. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We wanna to extend an invitation to everybody to come and join us for the 2021 MRA Spring Conference uh, here in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, which is gonna be on June 10th through 13th, uh, along with a couple days before that for some pre-conference activities. Uh, as everybody knows, this was canceled last year due to COVID. Um, we are moving forward with it this year, and we're confident that it's, uh, it's going to happen. It's probably going to look a little bit different than all of our other uh, spring conferences, and, and we're going to have a number of COVID mitigation uh, policies in, in place, and a lot of it's going to be happening outside, but it will be uh, uh, two days of learning and training and networking, uh, both classroom and field activities. Uh, uh, registration is open and early bird uh, pricing is available until the end of February. So if you want to come and join us for this conference, we encourage you to uh, go out to the, to the website um, and register here within the next week or so. Uh, we are excited to say we've got uh, 25 speakers. We've got 12 sponsors, including RECO, who's, uh, who's our sponsor for tonight um, and is helping us with the conference. Um, we're going to have uh, a full day of, uh, of classroom or, or class tent um, uh, talks from, uh, from a variety of speakers, and then we're going to have our SAR Olympics on Saturday, and we've got the full 5,800 acres of Seven Springs Mountain Resort 
Uh, we also have uh, eight exciting pre-conference workshops with a little bit of, uh, of everything going on from, uh, from canine to, uh, to rope rescue, to tracking and mapping and search management. All of the details of our pre-conference workshops are out on the website. Uh, it's happening in the Laurel Highlands, uh, Appalachian Mountains, just outside of Pittsburgh, about uh, 50 miles east of Pittsburgh. Um, and, uh, and conveniently located to a number of other locations. Uh, we have been getting some inquiries for people about, in addition to the conference, are there things that my family can do? And there's a whole bunch of things that are going on um, at Seven Springs. Um, so uh, this is not just for uh, rescuers, but also for rescuers' families. Uh, there's lots of things to do and lots of things to do uh, in the area, uh, there's rafting, uh, kayaking, climbing, caving, um, and there's also a number of uh, national parks and other uh, cultural sites there, including the Flight 93 Memorial Fort Necessity National Battlefield and uh, Flight Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water are, are all within an easy drive. So we'd love to see all of you uh, uh, out here in, in Pennsylvania in June, and we hope you will join us and we will put a link to the conference in the chat here momentarily. All right, Chris, thank you for the update. I appreciate that. My apologies for calling you Appalachian Mountain Rescue when it's Allegheny, of course. Um, and I imagine you guys are buried in a deep winter freeze and I trust that that will all be melted out by the time June comes. I wanna thank you again and thank you to uh, uh, to all your uh, members for the work they're doing to put that together. I uh, want to also just tell us, uh, remind us that um, the uh, Mountain Safety Info website has launched on the MRA, and I want to give Oyvind Hennings in a moment to tell us about it. Oyvind is the MRA MSI coordinator. I'm going to call on Oyvind, but I also talked to Oyvind um, just about an hour ago, I think, and he is uh, on duty with the helicopter tonight. So if they're out on a mission, then uh, we won't have them. So Oyvind, are you there by chance? Yes, sir. Oh, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And, uh, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, we had uh, um, a training by Manuel Genschwein uh, on the mountainsafety.info. And uh, I'm pleased to say that, that uh, thanks to Gary and Charlie, it's up on the MRA website. And, I'm sure I'm not alone to say that whenever I hear um, Manuel Genschwein speak, or if I read something by him, I, I, I learn a tremendous amount. And I got to say um, that the same is true for, uh, for, for Dale. Uh, and I'm, I'm tremendously looking forward to Dale speak, speak here tonight. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Ivan. Thanks for your work you're doing with MSI. And if you've not registered yet with MSI folks, um, the MRA website uh, enables you to do so. And uh, once you submit your request to register, uh, your name comes to us for some double check and then we ultimately uh, approve you to be registered to the MSI. And oh, even thanks for the comments about Dale. It's a real privilege to have Dale Atkins with us tonight. And how ironic that our sponsor for Dale's talk is RECO, which Dale has a long history with um, professionally as well. Um, we invited RECO to be part of tonight and uh, Dan Howlett, everybody knows Dan as Howie. Um, in fact, oftentimes I don't even know what Dan's last name is. Dan has submitted a little bit of a video and we're going to share that with you and then we'll turn it over to Dale. Hello, my name is Daniel Howlett, otherwise known as Howie. I'm here to talk to you for a couple minutes about the new technology that's been developed over the past 10 years by RECO. It is called the RECO SAR helicopter detector. Most of you are probably familiar with the handheld detector. It's been used and is being used in a lot of professional rescue organizations as a primary tool to go to an avalanche scene. And they both work the same way. There's two parts to the system. There's the detector, whether it's the handheld or the helicopter detector, and the passive reflector that's in a lot of different brands of clothing and hard goods and helmets, all types of footwear now. 
uh, that will have the reflector that basically reflects the signal back. The two pieces to this system are the detector. Well, there's three pieces. The detector, the remote control, and of course the helicopter. That'll work. The batteries that power the detector are inside the detector. And the batteries that power the remote control are inside the remote control, leaving us independent of having to have anything additional connected to the helicopter when you're using it to search. Typically, it'll take the remote control and it goes into the intercom system. For this demonstration, I'm plugging it into a little speaker so we can hear it boot up and do its thing. The remote control is real similar to the handheld with different levels of power. You'll let it boot up and, and see that uh, it doesn't take too long to get going. Now we've got good power on both devices and we're communicating. This is called the search tone. And you'll hear the search tone while you're searching. And since it's an analog system, just like uh, the handheld, uh, you'll hear the reflector as you fly over it. We have a reflector underneath it right now, and you can hear it. Sounds just like the tone out of the handheld, and that's how it sounds in your headset. Now, one of the neatest things about this uh, is you're searching 300 feet above ground level. So the bottom of the reflect detector is 300 feet above the ground, and in a wilderness search, so big drainages, big forests, uh, scree slopes, where you don't know where the mis missing person is, uh, we start the search flying at 60 miles an hour in a 300 foot wide squaw. So you can imagine how quick the wilderness search goes. In avalanches, it's gonna be a case by case basis on the elevation and how the pilot wants to go through the debris field, but it works very well in avalanche uh, rescues as well. I think uh, I've covered most of the facts. There's really good information at reco.com and I can be located or reached anyway at howie at reco.com if you have any additional questions or comments. Hey, have a great session. Thanks for listening. So I just want to say we really appreciate RECO being a sponsor of the MRA. Um, what Howie sort of mentioned there, and it's important for people to know, is the new helicopter detector uh, is not used only in avalanches, as was the handheld uh, designed for, but is used for searching large areas for missing parties. Uh, and I've had the privilege of working with and training with uh, the Alpine Rescue uh, team in Air Zermatt in Switzerland a few times actually, and just last January, uh, Ava Sophie and I were there when they were doing some demo of the RECO detection system, the helicopter detector, and I just wanted to show you some video of how that worked and how easily it hangs and, and is able to be flown. <laughs> So you can see how easily it flies. Pilots have no problem flying with it as an external load, uh, in this case, hanging from a um, AS-350 uh, aircraft in, in Zermatt, hanging from the cargo hook. And it's equally easy to, uh, to unhook as well, as, as you can see in this video. Really quick detach from the cargo hook, um, you know, because it's got that remote control unit, there's no cables, there's nothing really other than the, the uh, cable that holds it. Here's a close up, uh, some video of my daughter. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, so with that, we will uh, turn it over to Dale Atkins. This is a, this is a special privilege this evening for me. Um, Dale has been a mentor of mine, although many years younger than me, but in my uh, 30 years in search and rescue, Dale has taught me more um, than I've ever taught him. He's got 30 years plus, probably closer to 40, training and working uh, um, with professionals worldwide. He's an avalanche expert in so many ways. Um, and is uh, a published author and well-respected former MRA delegate to the ICAR Avalanche Commission. And as I mentioned, he's been with the uh, Alpine Rescue Team for a long, long time. I'm going to let uh, Dale decide if he wants to uh, admit how long it's been. But Dale Atkins, just a real privilege to introduce my friend, my mentor, and a guy who knows more than I'll ever know, ladies and gentlemen, Dale Atkins. Gosh, thank you, Charlie. Um, I don't know if I want to say how long I've been on Alpine, but we really didn't have color film back then. So it, it goes back <laughs> many decades. So I'll tell you what, let's uh, jump into the program. And, and again, thank you for the uh, introduction. And one more button here. Uh, and, and for Oyvind's kind words and uh, really the pleasure I've had of being part of the Mountain Rescue Association community for many decades. So I wear a lot of hats and in this, I'm gonna be speaking as a rescuer and yeah, the topic is wet snow, avalanches and, and rescue and that concern for mountain rescuers. But boy, the way this winter is going right now, oops, I wanted just a quick, reminder here. I'm going to do some surveys in the program tonight. That'd be great if you take part in these. You can use your cell phones. So what you'll want to do is text the message, Dale Atkins in capitals, to the number 37607. And you will get a little confirmation uh, message. And you can use your phones uh, when we get to some of our surveys here a little bit later into the talk. And this I'll flash back up in another uh, few minutes. So that number 37607. And just uh, my name, all in caps, 809. And Ava Sophia, post that in the chat as well. Keep going, Dale. So I uh, would we'll rewind here a moment. We're going to talk wet snow in a few minutes, but there's a lot going on this winter. Uh, avalanches are a big problem across the, the U.S. So I want to talk about that for just a little bit. And it's pretty remarkable. Uh, the 30-year average as of February 17th, we see about 15 avalanche deaths in the U.S., this year, we're already at 27, and this month alone, we've had 20 fatalities, and we're only 18 days into the month. So what's up? Because that 20 deaths, sad to say, that's, that's the most deaths we've had in a single month since going back to the 1920s. What are the causes? Well, I'm gonna give you my perspective on it. It comes down to four different elements from our weather, snowpack, human factors. That sounds straight out of any avalanche awareness talk and education. And it's the combination of these things that I think of um, causing us the grief this year. Our weather, well, for a lot of the winter, well, we had some early season snow, but we, for much of the winter in December and January, it was dry. And the dry snowpack, or I should say dry conditions, leads to a shallow snowpack. A shallow snowpack leads to the persistent weak layers. And we'll talk about those persistent grains here a little bit later. But there's also issues on the, I'll say the non-technical side, the human factors and how we perceive and manage ourselves with a considerable danger rating. And I think we've got some issues with uncertainty. And Oyvind and I were talking about this uh, earlier today and I'll, I'll share a little bit of my thoughts and they align with his and I'm sure with uh, many of you as well. 
If we look at these four satellite images, and, and what we're looking at is an overlay of the 500 millibar pressure height. But don't worry too much about that. What I want you to take away from this is a couple of things. Where the pressure gradient is tight, like what we have over New England and the Canadian Maritimes here, that's really where the jet stream is. So 500 millibars, it's about 18,000 feet in our atmosphere. As we come back over the central US and into the west, those pressure lines are far apart. We're in the doldrums, the weather doldrums. And this is mid-December. Just not much was happening weather-wise. Yeah, some storm systems may have crept through the US, but for the most part, we had a high, we had a ridge of high pressure that just dominated the western half of the US. Some storms made it in over uh, the Pacific Northwest and brought good snows to Washington and the, uh, on the Northern tier states, but still much of this, well, at least the Southwestern US was dominated by high pressure. Even when we got into the end of January in this uh, lower image here, you can still see we're in the weather doldrums in this call between systems. So not much was happening. But then as we started into February, and this last image is from about four, eh, 10 days ago, 11 days ago, we've got now a good strong Northwest jet stream. that's on the backside of a large trough of low pressure that's really across the US. And that's what's brought the Arctic cold uh, to the central states and all the way down into Texas. What it did for us in the, in the mountain West is it brought us a lot of snow and a lot of wind. But that, as a weather maker, really has only happened in the last couple of weeks. So the weather, yeah, dry snow years tend to produce weak snowpacks. And that's what we had going on. To give you another look at this, what I'm looking at is the snow tell data for different basins across the Western US. And a month ago, as you can see the greens, that's 125, 150%. We have that in the Northern tier states and in South Central uh, Alaska. And much of the desert Southwest is, was in severe drought. It still is in the big picture with snowfall water equivalencies at 50% and less. Well, we jump ahead a month to yesterday and you can see the colors are changing. There's more green in the north, the lighter colors here indicating about 100% of normal. And even uh, we've come up quite a bit here in the desert southwest. So we've gotten quite a bit of snow across the western US and even into New England as well. As I said earlier, dry years, shallow snowpack leads to weak snow covers. And that's the result of persistent weak layers. And persistent weak layers are formed by three grain types, depth or and facets. That's the sugar snow, the really loose cohesionless snow. And then there's surface or the winter equivalent of summer's dew. But as you look at these profiles from around four different states across the West, you can see the very stepwise uh, features of these profiles with the inversions with these, the more to the right you go, the weaker the snowpack. So we have strong snowpack here in Montana in the middle, but weak beneath. The same in Utah, strong in the middle, weak uh, below. Wyoming, weak in the top, but that's new snow, strong middle, weak in that lower third. Colorado, well, generally just weak all over, uh, but with multiple weak layers. But persistent weak layers are really difficult to try and interpret an avalanche danger or really, let me rephrase that. Persistent weak layers make it tough to judge the stability or instability of the snowpack. So check this video out here. This is from Montana about a month ago. The skiers all the way to the bottom, but look at the avalanche they trigger above them. So persistent weak layers lead to persistent avalanche problems. 
And the challenge is that these slabs, these persistent slabs, they often propagate in these surprising and unpredictable ways. And this gear going down was just fine. But turn that picture around, so to speak, and say you've got a skier who's ascending, snowboarder ascending, a snowmobiler ascending, they're going right up into the avalanche, into the trap. And we've seen quite a few avalanche fatal accidents this year by skiers, riders, snowmobilers that have triggered the avalanche from low on the slope. And then like pulling the log out of the bottom of the wood pile, down it comes. When we look at the human factors, the bottom line here is a considerable danger rating is really very dangerous. However, if you look at the literature, you look at the imagery, the icons, there doesn't look that dangerous because considerable is right in the middle of the five step scale. And we don't think of the middle as being dangerous, but it is because the reality is that the avalanche danger potential increases exponentially. So for each one step in the danger rating we go, we double the avalanche danger potential. So considerable danger is twice that of moderate. High danger is twice that of considerable. And in our terminology, we say that considerable danger means human triggered avalanches are likely. The well, high danger means they're very likely. Okay, that works on paper, but for a backcountry traveler, there's really no difference between likely and very likely. So when the danger is considerable, we've got to treat that with a tremendous amount of respect and avoid the avalanche terrain. Don't go into the avalanche terrain. That's easy to tell a backcountry skier or snowmobiler. For rescuers, yeah, you notice when accidents happen, the danger is considerable, that's when we get called out. So we've gotta be really careful about these considerable times. And we're gonna talk about that as it relates to wet snow here in the rest of the talk. Education, my fourth point. And a problem that I have with contemporary avalanche education is it focuses on risk. And risk is all about certainty and analysis. Yeah, we might use probabilities, but probabilities are degrees of certainty. But avalanches are all about uncertainty. Avalanches are a complex phenomenon in nature. Complexity means it's uncertain. Since we, with uncertainty, we can't focus on the analysis because we don't know what the solution is or the answer. We've got to focus on the process. And avalanche education isn't there. We focus on the analysis. And those of you that have been through avalanche courses and over the years have spent time in the pits, looking at the snow, trying to analyze it. Reality is we need to be looking at our process instead. So as I wrap up my little soapbox part here, I think the take home message for, the, for this year, this winter, is that you know, whatever your experience is, and if it suggests to you that uh, places that you, your experience suggests to you that it will be safe, this year they may not be safe. Persistent weakness, persistent slabs, they tend to break out big and far away from you. They're hard to escape. And that's been a big, that's been the theme this winter. So with that, let's transition to the wet snow side of things. And first off, don't be like these guys. Dealing in the summertime, don't just charge up the, the runnel or the gully in a snowfield. The gully's there because that's where everything comes down. That's the trash chute. But you'll see people in them, and that's where summer avalanches will run. So let's take a look at wet snow avalanches and what are the concerns that we should have as rescuers. So if you haven't logged in uh, to do the little survey, the poll, please do. And here's the question. Wet snow avalanches are most similar to which one of these critters? A rattlesnake, 
or the Africanized honeybees. So I'll let you log in. And if you haven't done it, if you have, just put A for rattlesnake, type in B for the honeybees, the Africanized honeybees, I should say. And let's see what we get out of this. Okay, let's call it a 40-60 split here. And I'm, I'm glad to see it that the bees are out in front because it's the bees that wet snow avalanches are most similar to. You think about it, rattlesnakes are very solitary. They try to stay out of the way. They're hard to, you've got to get in their face to, to get a rattlesnake to attack. It's the same thing with dry snow avalanches. You've got to get out onto the slopes in their way to get into trouble. The Africanized honeybees, they're aggressive. They swarm, there's lots of them. They go after you. And that's what happens with wet snow avalanches. Just a quick little summary of the differences between the dry and wet. When we look at the cause, the dry snow, it's the increased stress. It's extra, extra load that we're putting onto the slope. With the wet snow avalanches, it's a decrease in strength that's the problem. So melting, thaw conditions, weakens the snowpack. So we decrease the strength. The trigger, this is important, and I'll touch on this in more detail in just a moment. Dry snow avalanches, most accidents are human caused, human triggered. However, with wet snow, it's natural avalanches. When we look at the contributing factors, uh, the dry snow, it comes down to that increased load, of new snow, wind drifted snow. But with wet snow, we've got the sun, warm temperatures, uh, rain that can do it. And when these avalanches run, they have very different characteristics. The flow in a dry snow avalanche is very fast and they can be well over hundred miles an hour and often with that dust cloud, but wet snow avalanches, they're much slower, 40 miles an hour and very seldom will you ever see a dust cloud with them. So there's some differences there. We'll take a look at this skier. You can see some of the clues right there, just the little roller balls of snow and you'll see pinwheels. And this is a tiny little avalanche that entrains him. It catches his skis. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but watch how far he goes. I think you're noticing the debris in the upper part. So one of nature's billboards right there, a recent avalanche. So at least in this situation, the, the rider is on top, not a big deal. Maybe the, oh, the most shame is soiled shorts uh, than anything else. But just imagine if there were a terrain trap, a cliff, uh, a creek bottom, a crevasse. That very small avalanche could have easily piled up four, six, 10 feet deep. So wet slides have to be given a lot of respect. Talking about the accidents, very few people get killed or in trouble in wet snow avalanches. About one in five, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, about one in 20 victims uh, compared to dry snow avalanches where more than nine in 10 trigger their own accident or their own avalanche. But let's look at that triggering mechanism. With dry snow avalanches, more than nine in 10 are human caused. Very seldom is it a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time with a dry snow avalanche. But look at wet snow. Just over two out of three cases, it's a natural release that catches the people, it gets them in trouble. And with dry snow avalanches, we can avoid them. Wet snow avalanches are much, much harder to avoid. Yeah, where do they happen? Well, certainly Alaska and Washington, primarily because of the, the big peaks and the glaciers uh, there, but even Colorado is number three on the list with these late spring and, and summer avalanche deaths. Who gets into trouble? Well, I just said uh, it happens in Alaska and Washington. 
So it tends to be climbers. But in recent years, say in the last decade, we've definitely seen an increase in the number of skiers that have gotten caught and uh, even a few snowboarders in these summer avalanches. So here's a wet avalanche in, in France and I'm gonna play a little video. Don't worry, I'm gonna keep the volume down but there's some subtitles so that'll keep you entertained but it's uh, Saint-Francois Longchamp in the Savoie. Uh, this was a few years ago, wow, gosh, actually nine years ago. But here's this wet snow avalanche and you can see how slow it moves. But because it has such high density of flow, it is really destructive as it sweeps into this chairlift. Kind of like watching a train wreck in slow motion, I, I guess, with it. But wet snow avalanches, they're actually, even though there are very few accidents with them, there are a lot of wet snow avalanches that happen. Before we can talk about the wet snow, let's go back to how snow changes. And it goes from those nice six-sided snow crystals or flakes and it changes and takes on different shapes and forms as it metamorphosizes during the course of, of the winter. So fresh snow, the classic snow crystal. But you leave it on the ground and if there's a deep snowpack and you know, a little warmer conditions, the snow grains round. And even though they round, they actually become cohesive and strong because they center together. They, uh, there's necks that form between the, the valleys and they center and gain strength. So dry snow is strong snow. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's stable or unstable because that's how the layers are adhering. I'm just talking about the cohesiveness within a layer of snow. Well, dry snow, if the snow is shallow in colder temperatures, seasonal temperatures, it becomes weak with faceting. You can see the, the facets, the straight sides and the sharp angles on, uh, in the picture. And these grains, they don't center together. So they're loose, cohesionless, and they're weak. But we get into springtime or in more maritime areas over the course of the winter as temperatures rise and fall and rain and snow comes through. When the snow is frozen, it's strong. Uh, but when it's in thaw, whoops, it becomes very weak. And this is a, a picture of this cluster is what, well, we call it a cluster, but it's what we skiers call corn snow. And you can see the little um, clusters of ice that are frozen together with water. So you get a repeated cycle of freeze thaw, freeze thaw, and that will give you the corn snow. But when it's in thaw, it's dangerous. It's frozen, it's solid. And here's the bottom line is that wet snow is weak snow. But how wet is wet? If we start over here on the left with dry snow, and dry snow, we can't make a snowball with it. It just crumbles, falls apart in our hand. But we have moist snow and maybe warmer temperatures or a little bit of uh, misty uh, fog or even a, a light drizzle. That, that moist snow is very sticky. Makes it's, it's in fact, it's pretty strong. Wet snow, it makes a good snowball. And the wet snow is gonna turn your glove wet, but it just, you can't squeeze water out. It's a very wet snow when you can squeeze the water out by hand, that that is when the snow is, becomes very weak. And slush, well, it's sort of like Slurpee-like, but that only happens when the liquid water content is about 15%. And what we're concerned about is this transition between wet snow and very wet snow. Because when we go from a liquid water content of 7% to 8%, there's a huge decrease in the strength of the snow. And where the only real way we're going to see that, well, you could see it with a hand lens, um, 
is by squeezing the snow. And again, if you can squeeze the water, drip the water out of the snow, we're in a very wet, we have very wet snow and it's very weak. So when we deal with wet snow, it's really a system and it's all about the water and how that water relates to the stratigraphy of the snow. The water affects the strength of the snow and the energy. And, and by that, I mean really the, the incoming solar radiation or reflected long wave radiation on cloudy nights or rain. Uh, that's the energy that goes into the snow that can cause melt or thaw. And it's the, inter, the interplay of, of these three that affects the wet snow. So what factors contribute to wet snow? What, what causes the wet snow? So what I'd like you to do here is just type in what factors you think contribute to wet snow avalanches. You know, I'll throw a, you know, the sun is a big one. Yeah, the weather, absolutely. It's just uh, rain, sun, and temperature are the big ones. Those are the words that are getting most frequently used. But we're seeing other things like aspect elevation, clouds, uh, slope, fog. <clears throat> uh, and that kind of, here's a, a short summary of those things. We're looking at the snow stratigraphy, uh, temperatures. Temperatures are influenced by elevation, the radiation into the snow. That's affected by aspect, cloud cover, rain, time of day. All of these things play an important part in determining how wet the snow becomes. So let's try this one. How important is the air temperature into causing wet snow avalanches? Not quite, you know, it's about one third slightly important, one slide, one third very important, and about a third important. So it's a fairly even mix of slightly important, important, and very important. But let's talk about that. So how important is air temperature? And this comes from some research done by Simon Troutman who lives up in Bellingham. And he uh, works for the US Forest Service National Avalanche Center, which actually doesn't forecast avalanches, but they serve as, a, as the official government clearinghouse of, and coordination center for the US Avalanche Centers that are with the Forest Service. And I think as you look at these two graphs, that with minimum air temperature or the mean daily temperature, you can see that with the avalanche day, there's actually greater variability in temperature than there is on the non-avalanche days. And there's a, a bit of a positive trend in that with the mean daily temperature that it really has to be, a, the mean daily temperature has to be above zero C or freezing to have an avalanche day. Um, so temperature, it's not really as important as we tend to think. But what is important with temperature is the trend over several days. And when we can see the average temperature, that mean daily temperature staying above freezing for three days, that's when we really start to expect to see natural wet snow avalanches. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one's pretty important here because the strength of the snow decreases much faster than the snow strength increases. So that loss in strength in the morning or when the sun hits the slope happens really fast, but it takes a long time for that snow to regain strength at the end of the day. So just because the shadows have moved out onto the slope, just because the sun has set, does not mean that that snow is gained strength. It's only gaining strength very, very slowly. So if you have to wait to go into an area to help someone, go into an area to search, you've gotta give it 
a lot more time than we typically think. So don't be in a hurry to rush in just because the shadows have come across the slope and the temperatures are cooling. We look at this balance between fewer and more wet avalanches. Yeah, wind and cloud cover. Cloud cover reduces the incoming radiation during the day. If a snowpack is draining water, yeah, that's fewer wet snow avalanches. And we're fond of saying if it's raining on the snowpack, watch the creeks. If the creeks, if the creek water is coming up, it means the water is draining through the snowpack. If the creeks are staying down, they're not coming up, it means the water is staying in the snowpack where it's melting the bonds, lubricating sliding layers uh, and can be a problem. So more wet snow? Well, I said 72 hours and I think that applies more at the higher elevations, 48 works in the Sierras from what Larry Haywood found, uh, several hours of direct sun, the greenhousing under the clouds. So a cloudy night, temperatures stay warm. There may not be a good freeze. And then we can see water pooling in facet layers if you look for it. And I'll come to that you know, a little bit later here. So how do we know if it's wet? Well, we just put our hands into it. We walk in it. We look at it, we, we squeeze it, we can listen to it and we sink in it. And that's what tells us if it's really wet or dry. Looking at this slope, you can see the, the little drainage channels in the snow surface. The water's moving through it. That's a very strong snowpack. Though in the afternoon, it could get weak if you're trying to ski through it or snowshoe through it, uh, but it's not gonna be an avalanche problem. The sinking into it is really one of our best indicators besides the making a snowball with very wet snow squeezing water out. But let's use just the old GAR uh, approach to hazard evaluation, red, yellow, and green lights. And if you're walking, can you stay on top or are you sinking in? What does this mean? So here's Halstead, he's sinking in. The crust is starting to thaw at the top and he's sinking into the wetter snow below. And here he's really, he's, he's sunk at this point. He's laughing here, but I think that's only because we're not on a very steep slope. So what's it mean? If the snow surface is supporting you, yeah, it's a green light. It may be shifting to yellow because what's the trend? Is it starting to warm up or are temperatures cooling down? But you can pretty much go wherever you want. If you're sinking to your knees, well, what color would you give that? I'd give it a yellow. It's kind of a transition period. Um, it depends on, the, on which way the temperatures are going. Are they warming up or are they cooling off? So conditions are changing. Now we're sinking to our calves. That can be yellow, but it can quickly turn to red. And once you're sinking in boot top deep, that's time to get off and out away from uh, the steep slopes. And if you're in to your knees, you're, you're in too deep at that point. And that's really a dangerous situation and really you need to be on your way home by then. So as you're planning, responding to a mission, affecting a rescue, you really need to be anticipating what is going to happen to the snow over the next few hours while we're doing this operation. About crust. We have the Fernspiegel or the mirror crust that forms in the in the springtime. Um, it's nice to look at. It's kind of miserable to ski through. And I'm going to show you a video here from uh, West Yellowstone. March 20th, Ron Lionhead. And if you can't hear Ron, don't worry. Two and a half. But watch what he's doing. And, uh, about a five inch, really hard ice crust from the last couple of nights being. So a five-inch ice crust that's bottom, nice and hard, a good freeze. crystals that are saturated with water. And a couple drainages over a wet slide released on another steep east or uh, south-facing slope. And underneath that crust is wet, faceted snow. So Ron's doing the compression. You tap 
Depression or tap test? Depression tap test three, sheer quality one. It just popped right out. And this is a low angled slope. And it's just really wet, large grain faceted crystals. And that's the weak layer we're worried about with these wet slabs that may happen once this crust gets melted through. I think for most of us, if we were to experience a five inch crust, and we're able to stay on top of it with our skis, our crampons, our, our snowshoes, we're pretty excited by it because we can move around quickly. We're not breaking into it. But as you just saw with that video that Ron had, that wet snow underneath, it, the surface can be strong, but it's weak underneath and not adhering. And you can have a real serious avalanche problem in what appears to be a stable snowpack. So if you don't dig, you don't know. Ron mentioned about the wetness or the water getting down to the faceted snow. And I show this picture from the Crested Butte Avalanche Center from a few years ago. And what we're looking at is in that top foot from 105 to 137 centimeters, there's already, the snow is already thawing and the water has reached down to the 105 mark. But the faceted, the weak snow, it's moist right now, uh, just a little more than 10 centimeters or just a little bit more than four inches beneath that, that's the weak layer. And the concern is when that water that's caused by the melting can drain down and it hits that moist crust or that facet layer. So with this image right here, we take a dye and we spray it onto the snow surface and you can see how it drains down. But just underneath the saw, you can see where that water starts to collect, where it reaches the weak layers. And boy, as soon as the, the water reaches those weak layers, that's when the wet snow avalanches become possible. So stratigraphy of the snowpack, the structure matters. Digging pits is important even in this in spring and early summer. As I said very early in the beginning, the dry snow avalanches are a, a consequence of the increased stress. We overload the strength. Wet snow avalanches, we, we reduce the strength. And I'll try it again to get this back in. We reduce we reduce the strength in the wet snow avalanches. And I think all of us in, in the high mountains have seen these sort of uh, landscapes with lots of loose snow avalanches that have spilled out of the steep rocky areas. And they're all over, they're widespread. That's the swarming of the bees. Here's some larger ones. Or one that's uh, triggered out, that came out of this uh, little basin between the rock bands. But loose snow avalanches can also trigger slab avalanches. And slab avalanches are the, the big nasty brother of the loose snow avalanche. And with wet snow avalanches, we always have to pay attention to what's up above us. And it could come down on top of us. This avalanche, it's a, a big wet snow avalanche. You can see it kind of looks like wet snowballs and the dirt and mud into the and trained into the snow. But this was triggered by a couple of people glissading. The, their glissade started on cold, dry snow, but it, as they slid down the mountain, they moved into moist snow, wet snow, and then very wet and triggered an avalanche that then swept them down 800 feet and produced an avalanche that was over 100 yards across at the bottom. And it didn't end well for one of them. This was another avalanche outside of Silverton a few years back. Triggered in dry snow up high, but as it ran down, it, it released the wet snow and then it just bulldozed its way down the gully. Cornices, nasty thing to avoid any time of year, and especially in spring. And when they're dripping water, you can hear or see the water dripping off the cornices, it's time to be out 
out of the way of cornices. Don't be under them. Don't be on top of them. And this fellow, he actually, he's roped in, but he triggered an avalanche the size of a school bus. It was about 40 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 10 feet tall. Glide avalanches. We don't see these much in Colorado or in the Southern Rockies, but you definitely see them in the snowier climates, in the Cascades, the Pacific Northwest, the Sierras, or in big snow years elsewhere. And it's just the whole layer, the whole snowpack starts to slip and slide down the mountainside. But something to watch for is the buckling. Um, and by that, I mean, if you look at the image, the image here, you can see buckling here and buckling here. Well, the avalanche has already run, but maybe the surest sign of, of a glide release not just the, the cracks that open up, but is when you start seeing the buckling beneath the cracks that uh, you can expect glide snow avalanches. And then some of you in, in Utah may remember, gosh, it may have been 15 plus years ago now, uh, there were a couple of docks that went out for an early morning climb and got caught in a monstrous glide snow avalanche. The climbing route was all covered in snow, but it was smooth, steep rock slabs that released after a few hours of sunlight. Dust layers, that's certainly a problem for us in the Southern Rockies, not so much elsewhere, but if you've spent any time in Europe or Japan, they also deal with significant dust events on their snowpack. And here's looking at a couple of dust layers in the snowpack. You can see one is real dusty, the sixth episode and the, the seventh one, uh, not so much. But notice how coarse the snow is around the dust layer. The dust layer becomes a warm layer. Cold snow above it, below it, strong temperature gradient. We often see facets, sugar snow, form above and below the crust. Does it mean it's weak? Not necessarily. Um, so we look at this propagation saw test, you can see the dust layer, but where the fracture actually initiated and propagated was 10 centimeters below the dust event. So just because there's a dust layer doesn't mean that it's weak, but it doesn't mean that it's strong either. You've gotta be looking for other clues. And for those of you with uh, volcanoes in your backyards, this is from uh, Chile, but a whole bunch of dust e events out of that. And there, they actually said that the volcanic ash acted like concrete, uh, it, like cement and turned the snow into concrete. They just couldn't get failures on it. So where and when will these wet events uh, happen? It's a function of elevation and aspect. And if we look at this, uh, the circles here, the outer ring is, represents the lowest elevations and the center ring represents the highest. So when, when are we going to start seeing the wet snow events? Well, for us in the Rockies, it's in the springtime. For those of you in the Sierras or, or Cascades or more maritime conditions, Southeast Alaska, you can see it any time of year. But let's work on kind of the uh, aspect, conditional to the aspect on this. So the lowest elevations and south slopes are gonna warm up first. So we tend to see our wet snow avalanches there. And then they follow the sun. And I said, follow the sun because they'll start to show up first on the west side and then maybe on the east side. The west side tends to happen before the east side because it has, it gets the same, may get the same amount of sun, but being the Western exposure, it, it's under the effect of warmer temperatures for longer than the East aspects. North aspects will finally get into play at the lowest elevations, and, but it's at the highest elevation North aspects, those are the last ones to uh, start to produce the wet snow avalanches. So yeah, aspect, elevation do matter, as many of you pointed out. 
So we'll put this into practice. So we watch this uh, snowboarder here. You can tell the snow is shallow with the vegetation. Now he hits the wet snow and he just sinks. Triggers a small wet slide. And at this point, he's probably thinking, oh, that was interesting. And it runs down the gully. Doesn't seem like a big deal. Problem is, his buddy is still up above. So his buddy starts down, falls because the skiing is difficult, is tumbled and rolled around. Now it sort of hurts to watch. Fortunately, he's able to stand up, scoot out of the way. But it's really important to get the forecast. So if your response area is covered by an avalanche center, a, a regional or statewide avalanche uh, center, you need to get the forecast because that gives you the baseline. And don't just look at the pretty pictures and the, and the, the icons with it. Delve in deeper and look at the discussion and read through the discussion because there's great tidbits that are in there. You can see here that the new snow may produce some roller balls. Roller balls, the cinnamon balls, the pinwheels are signs of surface instability. A little further down, mentions the primary wet snow avalanche danger. It's gonna be the trigger wet relief, wet loose avalanches that are gonna be the problems, but it's only isolated for natural wet loose and slabs. But there's gonna be more information in the discussion. So take the time to look at it. So to start wrapping this all up, yeah, the snow cover, are we dealing with fresh snow, sugar snow or old snow? Rain on fresh snow, say within three days, maybe even five days, will result in avalanches very quickly. Rain on old snow, say beyond five days, oh, you can dump inches of rain onto the snow and the rain will just drain through for, most, for the most part. If you get some exceptional rain events, you know, speaking six, eight, 10, 12 inches of rain, that will that tends to produce some wet snow avalanches. If we have sugar snow, the depth hole, and water is able to drain down and get into it, we see wet releases there. For temperatures, watch out for the very warm days or the hot days. When I start hearing of record heat or record uh, temperatures being forecast in April and May, and especially if there's been recent snow, I'm going to expect there's gonna be wet wet snow avalanches. And those wet snow avalanches, they'll happen at the lowest elevations generally, because that's the warmer temperatures. And for that, you really only need about one day of an average temperature above freezing. At higher elevations, and by that I mean in the alpine areas, it's uh, about three days. The so Larry Haywood in, in the Sierras, at least around Lake Tahoe, they he finds it takes about two days with the average temperature staying above freezing. Yeah, cornices, don't trust them. And watch out for those cloudy nights because they'll keep the temperatures warm and warm will keep the snow wet. Aspects, well, are we dealing with north aspects or south aspects? Which are gonna become reactive first? Rocky areas, regardless of aspect, are gonna heat up so, and cause melting much earlier than open slopes. And once you're sinking into the snow, that's time to retreat. Time of day, yeah, typically it's mid morning, but it can last well into the evening and even after the sun has gone down because there's a delayed effect for that water to drain down through the snowpack in the evening, especially on those Western aspects. So as climbers, there's lots that we have to think about. And I'm sure you've thought about things as you're dealing with wet snow, but what should we as rescuers be thinking about? And I really like this picture and I find it terrifying. 
One is that's a loose snow avalanche. And we tend to think of loose snow avalanches as being small. But if you look to the upper right, there's also a couple of other small loose snow avalanches. And for whatever reason, those didn't run all the way down, even though they happened the same aspect in elevation. So dealing with the uncertainty, but it's really scary to have a whole bunch of people out searching a wet snow avalanche when it's still sunny and warm. So what do we think about? One, watch out for roofs. Certainly wet, wet snow can make for really difficult travel. And that's important to us because we're often trying to get to someplace quickly and we're often carrying more gear than we want to carry. So we want to watch out that we don't get hurt in moving through wet snow. Also, when you look at these avalanches, all these little, I'm going to put air quotes, wet snow avalanches, they, we often think they look small and un, unimpressive. But in reality, those are really big. And any avalanche, no matter how small it looks, is going to be overwhelming to a person who's stuck in it or trapped in it. So what do we need to be alert to? Here are some things to be alert to. And I'll let you see if you can think of some others. That to watch out for. You know, the thumbs up for the clear, cold nights. Thumbs down for the warm, cloudy nights. Really watch out for those multiple starting zones. Just because you have debris at the bottom of the slope does not necessarily mean it's safe if there's multiple starting zones and if there's snow still in those starting zones. We've talked about sinking in. In, in terms of the wet snow, we're very concerned about the very wet snow. So wet snow makes a great snowball. It gets your glove wet, but you can't squeeze the water out. But very wet means that you can squeeze the water out. In very wet snow is very weak snow. Be alert to working in and around gullies and coulars. You know, what's above you, what's below you, what other um, coulars feed into the one that you're in. And likewise, be very cautious around uh, rock bands, working above them and below them. It's, re it's real easy for a very tiny, shallow, wet snow avalanche, as we saw with the two skiers and the snowboarder, for a really small one to knock you off your feet. And you don't want to take a ride over the rocks. You don't want to have one of those coming down on top of you. So what should we do? To wrap this up, get the forecast. We need to know the weather. Dig quick, dig quick pits. Because what we're looking for is not just how strong and how thick that crust is at the top, but what we're looking for is the wet snow that's moving down from the thaw until it hits a weak layer or a very hard icy layer that you guys in the Northwest might have from earlier rain crust or melt freeze events. Is that water as it drains down, it hits that, that crusty surface, it's gonna start melting the bonds and, you know, and the snow will stop adhering. So dig the quick pits to look for them. Um, avoid the wet, soft snow. Talked about the gullies and coulars, being alert to what's above you and what's below you and who is below you. Uh, so if you've got other teammates that are coming up to, oh, sorry. The enemy of good is better. I just tried to get that out of the way. There we go. Uh, they're coming up to you. Maybe you're trying to move the litter down if the snow gets too wet, you may you probably don't want to be there, but you certainly don't want people under you. Cornices, we've talked about that. Use an avalanche guard. Generally, an avalanche guard is not going to be helpful with dry snow avalanches. In dry snow conditions, you use an avalanche guard to alert rescuers 
when there are other triggers, other skiers, other riders, other rescuers that are coming in on adjacent slopes or up above. But in the springtime, because most of our avalanche accidents are caused by natural releases, and those avalanches tend to run slower, an avalanche guard can make a difference and it can allow rescuers to get out of the way if they have a place to go. So everyone's got to know those escape routes and where they're headed. You may even consider having rescuers for rescuers. If you've got to get in to get somebody and you can't wait, have a backup team of rescuers that are right there and ready. But only go out if you're okay with what might happen to you. So you could get caught in a slide, but a gentle outrun might not be a big deal. Having rescuers there to help you, critical. Getting swept into a creek bottom, into a crevasse, over a cliff. Uh, the other rescuers probably aren't gonna save you. They may be able to get you out, but they may not be able to save you. But in real high hazard situations, a backup team is a, real, is a good thing to do. And sometimes we just have to wait and go later and let conditions freeze. But as we saw in that slide earlier, the snow loses strength very quickly, but it takes a long time for the snow to gain strength when it starts cooling down. So give it time and then maybe give it a little bit more time before you venture out. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining me tonight and Mountain Rescue Association. I'll stick around if there's any questions. Uh, Ava Sophia, any questions you see, please send them in. Uh, send in your questions on chat. Hey, Dale, it's Charlie. I'll, I'll save you having to pour through the chat because you're also going to see some uh, answers to some of your um, survey questions. And uh, let me just, I'm going to read through the questions that I've been pulling out of Q and A, but that said, I see a, a couple that might be uh, dropping in um, just in the last minute or two, but let me just cover the ones that dropped in while you were talking. First one, somebody pointed out, you're highlighting some problems with current avalanche education and also the way we look at and communicate avalanche danger. And uh, our questioner mentions it can be very difficult to understand what considerable danger, exponential probability, and a high degree of uncertainty really means, do you know if anybody in the avalanche world is talking about revisiting the avalanche danger scale and avalanche education writ large? There is some discussion and about the danger scale, it kind of comes and goes. And I've got to take some of the blame for considerable. I was part of the committee that came up with considerable uh, when we worked with the Canadian forecasters some 25 years ago or more. The problem is considerable is a great term for avalanche forecasters because it describes a situation when we don't expect natural releases to occur, but we do expect trigger releases to occur. But for a person who's traveling in the backcountry, there really is no difference between considerable or high. Avalanches are likely with both those ratings. So my long-winded answer is, yeah, we sometimes talk about it, but it loses steam pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the education effort, I think after this winter, I think, well, I know that we, or the avalanche community is going to start to revisit some of our education efforts, because I don't think we're teaching the right things when it comes to talking about persistent weak layers, persistent slabs, deep persistent slabs, and some other things. So stay tuned. Okay, well, you stay tuned four or five more questions, and then there might be some at the end of the chat. Um, somebody asked, 
how does baseline water matter, like areas next to water sources, streams, lakes, even oceans, and so on? Um, I guess maybe I might ask a little bit more, and and how do they mean by that? Uh, they they really oceans have the large more climate effect uh, because they they're warm. Uh, we have higher relative humidities. We have wetter storms, warmer temperatures. Um, lakes, you know, they've got to be large, like the Great Salt Lake. Um, the Great Lakes have, uh, can produce rain effect, or I should say lake effect snows, but it, they really don't influence the wetness of the snow. So the oceans affect climate, warmer and wetter. The, the uh, areas along the coast see the wetter snow. And Seth, I know you're on the call. Do you want to jump in and clarify your question and uh, let us know whether Dale answered it okay? Uh, sure, thank you. I, I think he answered it pretty good. I, I believe I asked that question when we were talking when he was asking what makes the snow more wet. So I was just curious if you know, snow next to a stream would have more water content uh, or higher percentage than like snow that's nowhere near a creek or other body of water. No, good, good question, Seth. And, and at the creek level or even the lake level, they're too small and they're not going to affect, they're not going to have a micro, even a micro effect on the snow uh, with that. But something you do see when you're out traveling about, especially in the cold winter times, is you'll often see a lot of surface hoar along the creek bottoms. Uh, and the surface hoar is that winter equivalent of summer's dew. So they, that can have an effect of, for dry to create surface hoar in weak layers, but it, it, it's dry, cold snow, not, not moist or wet snow. Thanks, Dale. Uh, next question is, what's the difference between creep and glide? Uh, between creep and glide. So glide is when the entire snowpack moves as a single unit at the same rate down the mountainside or down the slope. Creep is where the surface of the snow is moving faster than the snow down along the ground or the lower layers. And with creep, that builds up a difference in the stress, or it's really the different strain rates in the snow. So creep is what we generally see. Um, creep is how cornices form. Glide is what we often see off of the metal roofs before they slide when the whole layer of snow is moving down the roof. Okay, and just a reminder to everybody, if you've got any other questions, keep posting them. I've got a couple more uh, to throw out at you, but uh, Dale and we'll, we'll, look, uh, through the, um, we'll look through the end of the chat just to see what else there is. Uh, I'm gonna take a point of personal privilege and ask a question or three myself. First one is, uh, how does the high moisture content of snow debris in, in the wet snow avalanche um, in that debris, how does it impact the transmission or reception of avalanche transceivers, RECO, and for that matter, the, the impact of dogs' ability to uh, search avalanche debris? How does that high moisture content impact the work that we do? Great question. The more moist the snow, the more dense it is, the more packed it becomes with that, typically speaking, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. So with an avalanche transceiver at 457 um, <clears throat> kilohertz, that is a very long wave. It's about 660 some meters in length, if I remember right. And snow does not attenuate that signal. But you get to the RECO uh, signal and that's in the megahertz, and that's a much shorter, that's a really short wavelength. And shorter waves are easier to attenuate. So moisture starts to attenuate the RECO signal. It's not necessarily the density, 
but it's the actual water, liquid water content. The RECO signal goes through ice very easily because it's got a nice lattice work and I'll, I'll leave it at that, the atoms, or I should say the molecules. But in wet snow, especially with liquid water, that starts to really attenuate the signal. So for transceiver, no effect on range. RECO cold, dry snow, 20, 30 meters. Warm, wet snow, it may drop to 10, 10 meters for wet snow. Very wet snow, you can squeeze the water out. It's gonna drop down to maybe uh, five, eight meters. Get into slushy type snow, uh, it's gonna drop to maybe just two or three meters. In terms of the dog scent, the dog scent is going to percolate up through the channels in the snow. It doesn't, it doesn't really go through the microstructure of the snow. So the more dense the snow, the harder or longer it takes for the scent to rise to the surface. But sometimes, well, I shouldn't say sometimes, with wet snow in an avalanche that runs far enough, the debris will start to look a lot like snowballs. And if you're buried close to the surface, you can actually have quite a bit of airspace uh, with the, all those balls packed together. Think of a bunch of oranges in a crate or in a box. There's a lot of airspace in it. But if you're buried more deeply, that wet snow is just gonna pack up and it can really seal you in. Okay, thank you on that one. Um, Oivan was asking if the quick, de you remember that chart you showed where the decrease in shear strength was, was pretty rapid and the increase pretty slow. And the question was whether that quick decrease in shear strength presumes freezing temperatures overnight. Yeah, that would be starting with the freeze overnight. And then certainly there's a, a function of, well, how thick is that crust that formed overnight to how long it's going to take for that crust to thaw and for that snow to really become weak and for the water to drain down. But what we know from accidents that have happened, especially ski area ones, where we've had skiers out on a slope that were just fine staying right on top and firm, hard, crusty snow, and then have a half hour later, have the entire slope rip out because it got wet. And it happened in literally 30, 30 minutes or even less. So yeah, or even it, to your question, it, we're assuming a freeze overnight. So it's starting real strong, but then it, the strength drops very quickly as the snow thaws. And Dale, we're wrapping up. We got just another minute, one more question. Um, creep would induce some sort of shear stress through the depth of the snow, is that correct? And if so, what effect would the presence of that shear stress have? So the shear, the shear stress does affect the snow. And when we're talking about the stress, it's really, what we're looking at is, is strain. We're looking at how the snow is deforming. And as that the stress or the strain is different across the height of the snow, the surface layers start creeping faster than the layers below. And the greater that strain or the, or the greater that difference between layers, the greater the forces are gonna be on the snow and the more likely it is to avalanche. Cool, thank you, Dale. Um, folks, I'm gonna leave the uh, meeting uh, up and open for a few minutes if anyone wants to look through any of the chat, but I think we've covered pretty much all of the questions, but we'll leave the, uh, the Zoom link live for maybe five minutes or so. I, I mentioned when I introduced Dale uh, that he's been a mentor to me and um, just a real, it's been a real privilege to learn from him and every time he teaches, I learned something new like today, when more than once he used the term stratigraphy. And I thought, you know, God, I feel awful dumb not knowing what that word is. So I looked it up on the internet and uh, here's what I got. Stratigraphy, the branch of geology concerned with the order 
and relative position of strata and their relationship to the geological time scale. Dale, that wasn't any help whatsoever, that definition of the internet. Can you give uh, the Dale Atkins definition of that word and then we'll let you go, stratigraphy. Yeah, stratigraphy is just, that's the layered structure of the earth, of the rocks or of the snow. And the stratigraphy changes over time because geology with heat and pressure. And it's even with temperature and pressure with snow. The difference is the time scale. The, the changes caused by the pressure, the load of the snow to those layers in the, in the seasonal snowpack, that can happen on the order of hours, days, weeks, or months. Yeah, with the ground, it takes it a few million years before we notice something. But it's the same basic forces at, at play. I think I had a sense what it meant, but thank you for that uh, more clear definition. I hope uh, it helped. Dale, we're, we're grateful to you for your, your career uh, and all the time you've spent in the Avalanche community and, you know, having, it was a privilege to work alongside you on Saturday in an Avalanche rescue that Alpine Rescue Team had and it just always a privilege to watch you in both your educational and your live rescue capacity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us, Dale Atkins. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, a reminder to everybody that this will be posted as a recording on the MRA website just as soon as I can convert it, get it up onto our YouTube and post it on the website, which God willing will be in the next few days, but it won't be tomorrow. I'm going to be off skiing. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the third Thursday in February and rather in March. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dale. Good night. Thank you, Charlie.